Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Up to now, we have, for the last two weeks, discussed a miscellaneous variety of common fallacies, focusing essentially on a number of errors that you should not commit. Now, this evening, we're going to begin the more positive part of the course by discussing positively and systematically the principles of correct reasoning. And, of course, we will, as we go along, collect further fallacies appropriate to the various types of arguments that we discussed, but we want to go at it more systematically now. And we have to begin by organizing the field of argumentation, and there are two different kinds of argument, as you undoubtedly know, deductive and inductive argument. Now, I will say just a word uh, at the outset here this evening on the distinction between these two types. And I will follow the Aristotelian tradition in giving you the definition of the difference. Induction, according to Aristotle, and deduction are differentiated by the fact that, in a certain sense, they move in opposite directions. In inductive reasoning, you go from a number of particular observations to a general or universal conclusion, embracing the entire class. In deductive reasoning, you go in the reverse direction. You start with a general or universal premise and apply it to a particular case. Let me give you now a formal Aristotelian definition of induction. It would be on this order. The process of reasoning to a general or universal conclusion on the basis of a number of particular observations. Should I repeat that? The process of reasoning to a general or universal conclusion on the basis of a number of particular observations. So to use the example we mentioned in a past lecture, if you say, pointing to one particular puppy dog, he wags his tail when he's happy, and then you encounter the same in another, and in another. And after a few points, you get the principle involved, let us assuming that that is valid, and you generalize, and you say, all puppy dogs wag their tails when happy. That is an example of induction which will be valid or invalid, depending upon how you choose the sample, something we will discuss when we get to the section on induction. Now, according to Aristotle, deduction is the reverse process. It's the process of applying a universal or general proposition to a particular case, and thereby coming up with a particular conclusion. So, for instance, you would start with, if we use the same example, all puppy dogs wag their tails when happy, then you turn to Fido and say he is a puppy dog, and you conclude, therefore, Fido wags his tail when happy. That structure would be a deductive argument, starting with the universal, applying it to a particular case. Now, I have to put one amendment in here, which logicians frequently point out. It is possible in deductive reasoning to have a conclusion which is just as general, just as wide as your premise. It is not the case that it is always true in deduction that you apply it to something narrower or to a more particular example. For instance, consider this argument. You don't have to take it down because you can remember it, but just as an example. All men are rational beings. They have the faculty of reason. All rational beings are moral agents. Therefore, all men are moral agents. Now, my conclusion in this case is no broader, no wider than my premise, but that is still deductive reasoning. So uh, we amend the definition of deduction to include a case like this, and I could then give you as a formal definition if you want to take it down. Deductive reasoning is the process of reasoning from a universal premise to a conclusion which is no wider in extent. The process of reasoning from a universal premise, or it could be more than one, one or more universal premises, to a conclusion which is no wider in extent than the premises. Now, we are going to be focusing on deduction for the next several weeks, and we'll get to induction 
at the end of the course, and I'll have more to say about it uh, at that time. Now, in turning to deductive reasoning, we first have to make a distinction between two independent questions. And I might say these same two independent questions are applicable in inductive reasoning also. These two questions are the question of truth and the question of validity. The question of truth and the question of validity. And the first question, the question of truth, is simply, are the premises of the argument true? Are the premises of the argument true? In other words, do they state facts? Do they describe things as they actually are? Do they correspond to reality? Those are all different meanings of saying, are the premises true? Now, a separate, distinct question is, is the inference valid? Is the inference valid? Now, you recall that inference, I defined at the opening night, was simply the process of passing in thought from the premises to the conclusion. I gave you that definition some weeks ago. Now, the question, is the inference valid, is entirely distinct from the question, are the premises true? What we're asking when we ask, is the inference valid, is, does the conclusion follow from the premises? Does the conclusion follow from the premises? Is the reasoning such that given these premises, you must subscribe to the conclusion? Does the con is the conclusion necessitated by the premise? Now, for instance, if I give you, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. My premises are true, and in this case, the inference is valid. The conclusion that Socrates is mortal does follow. If I give you, all men are mortal, all pigs are mortal, therefore all men are pigs, the premises are true, but the inference is invalid. The conclusion does not follow. Now, we use these terms truth and validity in a very specific way. We only apply the term truth, or its negation falsehood, to the premises or to the conclusion. You can say, is this premise true or is it false? Is the conclusion of this argument true or is it false? In other words, the terms truth and falsehood are applied to the separate ingredients, the premises and the conclusion. The term validity is applied to the reasoning itself, to the relation of the premises to the conclusion. You can speak, is the inference valid? Is the reasoning valid? You can even say, is the argument valid? Understanding that you simply mean by that, does the conclusion follow from the premises? Now, it should be clear to you that these are two independent questions. You can have true premises and a valid inference. You can have true premises and an invalid inference. You can have false premises and a valid inference. You can have false premises and an invalid inference. If you want an analogy to keep this distinction in mind, think that you get a bill from a credit card company. And on, it lists all the various items uh, that you are allegedly ran up, and then it lists the total at the bottom. Now the total at the bottom would correspond to the conclusion of the argument, if we're using it as an analogy to a process of reasoning. Now there are two different ways that that conclusion, that total at the bottom of the column, could have gone wrong. Two independent ways. One way would be, one or more of the individual entries are incorrect. They're mistaken. They charged you $75 for a meal, which was only 73, or whatever it happens to be, however many times it happened. So you could have errors in the total because of errors in the individual entries. Or, that of course corresponds to, are the premises true? Or, the, premise, the, the entries in the column could be immaculate and perfect, but the addition could be wrong. You could have put them together wrong and thereby come up with a total that is not justified. And that would correspond to the question, is the inference valid? Have you put the premises together in a justified way to reach a conclusion that they actually lead to? Now, sometimes, as you could see in the case of this bill, if you make enough errors, by sheer luck, 
you will come up with the correct conclusion because your errors will cancel each other out. If there's enough errors in the items and in the addition, by sheer blind luck, you might come up with the actual total you owe. And the same is true in reasoning. By enough mistakes in the premises and or the reasoning, you might come up with a true conclusion. Obviously, however, that would simply be an accident. The only time that you can know that your conclusion is true is if you can answer yes to both of these questions separately. Yes, my premises are true. Yes, my inference is valid. In that case, you can then say, I know that this conclusion is true. Now, we are going to focus in our discussion of deduction for the next several weeks exclusively on the question of validity. We can't take all questions at the same time, so we are going to temporarily set aside the question, are the premises of the various arguments we will be considering true? Now, I do not mean to suggest that the truth of the premises are unimportant. Obviously, that is a crucial factor to the ultimate, uh, our ultimate ability to know whether our conclusion is true. But we're simply dividing up these two questions and studying them one at a time. We will discuss more the question of how do you establish the truth of the premises when we get to the discussion of definitions and induction. So for now, we're simply going to ignore that question. We'll assume that the premises are acceptable of the arguments that we deal with. And you can think of it as like if this were a math class, we're simply having exercises in the rules of addition. And then we'll worry later about how we check the items we're adding. Now, if you get this point at the outset, you won't be bothered. Otherwise, you're going to be enormously bothered because I'm going to be taking arguments which have screamingly false premises and fantastic, unbelievably absurd conclusions and saying this is a perfectly valid argument. Now, if you hear that word in, uh, valid in that connection to mean I subscribe to the premises or the conclusion, you will validly think that something seriously wrong has happened. What I'm always, when we say an argument is valid, going to mean exclusively. If these premises were true, if we accepted them, this conclusion would follow. Whether the conclusion is true, of course, depends on the additional question which we are setting aside, are the premises true? You have that point. All right. Now let's turn to deductive argument then. How are we going to approach the question of the rules of validity of deductive argument? Well, there are a great many types of deductive argument. And it's traditional in introductory logic courses to take the main types, the ones that come up most often in daily life and in the sciences. And we are going to, therefore, make no attempt to cover every conceivable type of deductive argument, but simply those which are the most common and the most important. How are deductive arguments classified? Well, there's a long tradition for thousands of years which says you classify arguments, you name them and describe their validity in terms of the type of statements which make them up, in terms of the type of statement, that is, premises and conclusion, which make them up. So at the outset, let me say that there are three basically different types of statement which are going to enter into the arguments which we discuss in this course. And I'll give you a brief characterization in advance of each of these three types of statement. And then different combinations of them will yield different kinds of arguments. The first is a statement that is called a hypothetical statement. H-Y, well, you know that word. <laughs> hypothetical, just like in English. <laughs> and it is any statement of the form. If something then something. If you are a man, then you are mortal. If you fall in a puddle, then you get wet, etc. The key structural words indicating that type of statement are simply if, then. A second type of statement we're going to look at is called an alternative statement. An alternative statement.
And it is of the form either something or something. Either you are alive or you are dead. Either you are dry or you are wet, etc. Any statement of that either something or something structure is called an alternative statement. And finally, there is a statement which for our purposes in this course we will simply categorize negatively. A straightforward categorical assertion with no if-thens and no either-ors. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. This is a class on logic. It's very cold out tonight, etc. Any straightforward categorical assertion which has no ifs, no either-ors, just a plain categorical utterance, and that is called a categorical statement. Now you will see that we uh, classify arguments and work out the rules of their validity according to the different combinations of these three types of statements. Now let us plunge right in to the first type of argument we're going to do this evening. Now you have to bring out the exercise booklet. Uh, which I asked you to bring each week, and turn to page 14. Page 14. Which says illustrative material, and then the subheading is 4, lecture 4, which is where we are now. And I've numbered these for easy reference. Consider number 1 there. On the very first one on page 14. Now, for the moment, ignore all the P's and Q's and parentheses and the funny looking stuff on the right and just read the English words. And you will see you have an argument there with two premises and a conclusion. The premises are if this man has worked hard, then he is tired. Second premise this man has worked hard. Conclusion therefore, he is tired. Notice, by the way, that it is a convention which you'll find helpful in working arguments always to draw a line under your premises, separating the premises from the uh, conclusion. Now, what is the content of this argument in terms of the type of statements that make it up? The first statement, if this man has worked hard, then he is tired, is a hypothetical statement. The second premise, this man has worked hard, is a categorical statement. And the conclusion, he is tired, is a categorical statement. Therefore, the pattern of this type of argument is a hypothetical premise followed by a categorical premise with a categorical conclusion. Now, any argument with this combination is given the name a mixed hypothetical argument. A mixed hypothetical argument. And I think you can see the obvious reason for that. A mixed hypothetical, because it hinges on a hypothetical statement, but it is a mixture which has hypotheticals, one hypothetical statement and then combines that with a categorical premise to, real, to yield a categorical conclusion. Now, consider the fact that this Still look at number one. We'll stay with that for a few minutes to uh, bring in some more terminology. It obviously has a certain structure, this argument. It says, if a certain thing is true, then another thing is true. And then the next premise tells us, but the first thing is true. And then the conclusion says, well, then the second thing must be uh, true. Now, we are going to want to make reference to the structure of this argument and not to have to all the time repeat the first thing and the second thing. So we introduced two new words, which I'd like you to be familiar with. The part that comes immediately after the if and before the comma in the first statement, in other words, the part that reads, this man has worked hard, is called the antecedent, A-N-T-E. Well, that one you know too, C-E-D-E-N-T, -E antecedent which is simply that which comes before. That is Latin for that which sits before. And it is by definition, whatever follows the if and precedes the then is called the antecedent. 
And then a name is given to the part that comes after the then. In this case, he is tired. That is the thing which results from the antecedent, which flows from the antecedent, which is a consequence of the antecedent, and it is called the, what did you say, the result? No, it happens to be called the consequent. Ending in T, please. Q-U-E-N-T, not C-E. The consequent. Now, those are not too hard to keep those two names in mind. And then you will see that this argument has the following structure. If a certain antecedent, then a certain consequent. And then the next premise tells you about the antecedent is true, and the conclusion says, well, then the consequent must be true. Now, it should be obvious to you that there are millions of possible arguments which have exactly that same structure. I could take that little mold, that pattern, and give you endless examples limited only by when you would uh, collapse from sheer fatigue. If this man is rich, then he needs a chauffeur. But this man is rich, therefore he needs a chauffeur. If you step into a puddle, then you get wet. But you stepped into a puddle, therefore you get wet. I could even have false premises and it would not affect the structure of the argument. If three and three likes elephants, then four and four like bananas. Three and three does like elephants. Then four and four does like bananas. I can even have statements that are partly meaningless. If you are an ish, then you are a trish. But you are an ish, therefore you are a trish. Now it's obvious that as far as validity is concerned, now remember, I'm using validity to mean only does the conclusion follow from the premises. It's obvious that as far as validity is concerned, all these examples I just gave you stand or fall together. If any one of them is valid, they're all uh, valid. They have the same status as far as validity is concerned. Now from this we can draw a lesson which will hold true throughout the discussion of deductive reasoning. And that is, validity is a function of the structure of an argument. It's a function of the structure of the argument. Validity is independent of the content, the particular filling, whether you talk about hardworking men or two and two or falling in puddles, it doesn't make any difference. If it has a certain structure, it will always have a certain validity, yes or no, depending upon whether it's valid or not. Now, this fact was first discovered by Aristotle, that validity is determined by structure. And his word for structure was form, as against, you see, the content of an argument. And that is why, to this day, courses in logic that focus on deduction are called formal logic. Because the first thing they do is say, is point out Aristotle's discovery that whether the conclusion follows or not is determined by the form of the argument. Therefore, to determine validity, we do not need to know the content. We need to know only the structure. And therefore, the first thing we do is say, let us dispense with the content and just put before us in naked skeletal form the structure of this reasoning. Work out the rules of which structures are valid and which aren't, and then we will always know. Now, for this purpose, we engage in what's called symbolizing. We simply let some letter stand for the antecedent and some letter stand for the consequent. Now, theoretically, you're free you're free to this moment to make any letter or mark that you want stand for the antecedent or the consequent. But there is a venerable tradition which uh, I have followed. There's absolutely nothing sacrosanct about this, and if you want to assert your own individuality, you can change it. But uh, it's traditional for I don't know how many centuries for the P to stand for the antecedent and Q to stand for the consequent. And you will see that I have, therefore, put parentheses around the antecedent and put a P over it, and put parentheses around the consequent and put a Q over it. And then in the second premise, when we restate that the antecedent is true, I've put another P around that because it's the same one again. And of course, the conclusion is uh, he is tired. We put a Q. So the structure of our argument is, if P, 
then Q. P, therefore, Q. But, and we would like to write that separately. It would, however, be intolerable if you do many of these to have to write. If P, then Q, because you'd have to write I, F, T, H, E, N, and a comma, which would be seven characters, which is simply too much for anybody to put up with if you do many of these. So logicians have devised a symbol which has no meaning other than if then. And it is that symbol which you see on the right of the argument, a horseshoe on the side like that. That little symbol simply means if P, then Q. Or if you want it in a single word, you can read it, P implies Q. P implies Q. P leads to Q. Therefore, on the right of that number one, we have the symbolic structure. Notice the little three dots before the Q. That's a way of saving us from writing the word therefore out. And it tells us that what comes after it is the conclusion, in this case, Q. All right. Now all we want to know is, is this type of argument valid? If it has a structure like this, is it valid? My premise tells me P implies Q. And my next premise tells me P is true. Am I entitled to conclude that Q is true? You see, it depends entirely on the structure. It doesn't make any difference what P and Q mean. But simply, does this uh, structure justify this conclusion? Well, to answer this, we have to refer to what does it mean to say P implies Q? What does it mean to say if P, then Q? Does that statement, the hypothetical statement, that P implies Q, does that statement tell us that P is true? No, doesn't commit itself one way or the other. Does it tell us that Q is true? No, it doesn't commit itself one way or the other. It gives us, however, only one piece of information. If P is true, then Q must be true. That's the one thing it tells us. Well, if it tells us that, and then the next premise goes on and says, yes, P is true. Inescapably, then, we must come to the conclusion, Q is true. Therefore, any argument of this structure, we say, is valid. Now, I remind you, and I, I won't keep reminding you, but just one last reminder. That doesn't mean that it's a good argument. Maybe the premises are crazy and the conclusion is hopeless. When we say it's valid, we mean merely from these premises, this conclusion follows. Now we want a name for this particular form of the mixed hypothetical argument in order to distinguish it <coughs> from other forms that we're going to look at. And logicians have decided that they are going to name these forms according to what the categorical premise does, according to what the second premise does. Now, in this case, the second premise tells us the antecedent is true, right? It simply affirms the antecedent. It says, yes, the antecedent is true. Now, what would be a good name for the form which affirms the antecedent? It's called affirming the antecedent, right? So what you have before you in number one is an example of affirming the antecedent in a mixed hypothetical uh, argument. Now, please try and remember that it's a matter of convention that the names are given according to what the second premise does. Obviously, in this case, the conclusion affirms the consequent, but we, it happens to have been named according to what happens in the premise. And in this case, the premise tells you the antecedent is true. So it's called affirming the antecedent. All right, affirming the antecedent is valid. And it is always valid when it has that structure. Valid meaning the conclusion false. Now there are three more forms of the mixed hypothetical. Look at number two. That gives you a different form of the mixed hypothetical. If this man deliberately kept the same premise, if this man has worked hard, then he's tired. Now we say this man has not worked hard. And we're concluding, therefore, he is not tired. 
Now, first, a word on the symbols. If we are using P for the antecedent, this man has worked hard. We will obviously need some other symbol for this man has not worked hard. We want some symbol that will stand for not P, the negation of P, the denial of P. Now, there are different books and different systems you can use. The one I learned, which is the simplest, is that little thing that looks like an apostrophe beside the P. I hope you don't think that's just a typographical error. That is the signal of negation, which is read simply P prime, P-R-I-M-E, P prime. And that simply means not P. As I say, there are other symbols for negation, but this is the one uh, we'll use. It's simple enough. So there I have collected the structure on the side of number two. P implies Q, P prime. P is not true. Therefore, Q prime. Uh, Q is not true. Now, if you were to name this particular form of the mixed hypothetical, and remember, we always name by what it does in the second premise, what would be a good name for this one? Well, you guessed close. It is denying the antecedent, it's called. Denying the antecedent. Now the question is, is this reasoning valid? P implies Q. If P, then Q. But P is not true. And the person concludes, therefore, Q is not true. How many think that is valid reason? We have some takers. How many think that it is not valid reason? No, you're correct. This is not valid reason. Any argument of this structure is invalid. To understand the reasoning here, you must grasp clearly what is meant by the if-then statement, by the hypothetical statement. The hypothetical statement here simply tells you, if a man has worked hard, then he is tired. Does it say hard work is the only possible explanation of tiredness? Does it say if a person is tired, he must have worked hard? No, it doesn't. It says simply, if you work hard, then you're tired. But it leaves wide open the question, maybe there are dozens of other things that would make you tired. For instance, you've been sick for a long time. If you've been sick, then you're tired, maybe. Or you watch television for 40 hours without a stop. <laughs> well, you might not call that a hard work, but it could make you tired. Or you're coming out of a trans uh, of LSD in another dimension and you feel tired. The premise doesn't exclude any of those. It doesn't say, only if a man worked hard is he tired. In which case, you could say, well, he hasn't worked hard, so he's not tired. It says, if he's worked hard, then he's tired. Now, from that, of course, you cannot conclude, therefore, just because it isn't true that, therefore, he's not tired. It would be as though I say, if you stab a man in the heart, let's assume with all the right conditions, a sharp knife, and you've got right in the center of the heart, and you turn it around and so on, but we don't bother about that. <laughs> I suppose I argue like this. If you stab a man in the heart, then he will die. But you didn't stab him in the heart, therefore he won't die. That's obviously invalid reasoning, because I didn't say only if he's stabbed in the heart will he die. So you have, for those of you who know the distinction between a necessary and a sufficient condition, the statement P implies Q gives you only a sufficient condition of Q. It says P is enough to produce Q. If you have P, you'll get Q. But it doesn't tell you that P is necessary to get Q. It doesn't say you have to have P to get Q. And consequently, any reasoning of this form is invalid. Now, a little later, we're going to discuss what do you do if your premise was only if P, then Q. And we'll have a whole production made of that when the time comes. But for now, I simply want to point out to you that the, the argument as presented in number two, simply that P implies Q, P prime, therefore Q prime, is invalid reason. So you have your first formal fallacy now of deductive reasoning. It's simply called the fallacy of denying the antecedent. The 
fallacy of denying the antecedent. Now, there are obviously two other forms left, which I did not uh, put down on the sheet, so I'll simply dictate it to you briefly. Now, if you want to save uh, yourself from writing, I'll use shorthand in dictating. Uh, if you understand that if you wanted the full thing, you should write, this man has worked hard, but I'll just condense that to worked. And instead of he is tired, I'll just say tired. And then, then you can fill in the rest of the English and make it pleasant sounding, but it'll save your writing. Here is the model for a third type of mixed hypothetical. Take this down. If worked, then tired. Second premise, tired. In other words, he is tired. Now I draw a line. Conclusion, worked. Where we're taking that as shorthand for he has worked hard. Now I'll put the symbols around that. For worked, you'd have P. For tired, you have Q. For the second premise, simply says he is tired. Put a Q around that with parentheses around it, and your conclusion, he worked, uh, uh, we're just using the word work, for a P. So collect your symbols and write them on the side, and you'll have P implies Q. Q, therefore, P. Now, what would you call this one? This is affirming the consequent. Remember, we always name them by what happens in the second premise. And in this case, the second premise tells us the consequent is true. We conclude, the person is trying to conclude, therefore the antecedent is true. So it's called affirming the consequent. Now, is this version valid or invalid? How many say this argument is valid? How many say it's invalid? Well, again, the majority sentiment. I don't say that in order to commit verecundiam. <laughs> But it just happens to be the case that you are correct. This argument is invalid for exactly the same reason as the preceding one was. <clears throat> it doesn't tell us P is the only possible explanation of Q. It doesn't tell us only P leads to Q. And therefore, the fact that Q is true, we cannot infer P is true. Maybe something else other than P produced Q in this case. Therefore, you can say as a general law, Affirming the consequent is invalid. And now let's write down the last form of this one. And here again, I'll dictate it to you in shorthand. If worked, then tired. Not tired. Conclusion, not worked. You understand that shorthand, for if this man has worked hard, then he is tired. He is not tired, therefore he has not worked hard. Put the symbols in on this one, P for your antecedent, worked, Q for tired. Then on your second premise would be Q prime, he is not tired, your conclusion would be P prime, he has not worked. Collect it on the side, and you'll have P implies Q. Q prime, therefore, P prime. Now think. First of all, what are you going to call this type? Denying the consequent. Right. Denying the consequent. Because we always name them by what happens in the second premise. Now is this type valid? Now think. Is this type of reasoning valid? How many say yes? How many say no? We have a much closer division of opinion here. The answer is this type is valid. This is, <laughs> somebody just cheered. Uh, this type of reasoning is valid. And again, to grasp the validity, you have to go back to the meaning of the if-then statement. The statement tells us if P is true, then Q is true. And then it goes on to say, but Q isn't true. Well, given that setup, you have no choice but to say P couldn't be true. Because if P were true, Q would be true, and it isn't. You got that? I'll give it to you in words. It says, if he's worked hard, 
then he must be tired. And it has to be that he's tired if he's worked hard. That's what the premise tells you. And the next one says, but he isn't tired. Well, then the conclusion must be he didn't work hard. Because if he had worked hard, he would be tired. And he isn't. Got that? Putting it abstractly. When you have this structure, it is always valid because the premise tells you P leads to Q. Combine that with not Q, and your conclusion must be not P because if, you had a con if P were true, it would have led to Q, and it didn't. Therefore, we can say that denying the consequent is always valid. So we have in summary of the mixed hypothetical argument four different forms. Two are valid, that is, affirming the antecedent and denying the consequent. And two are invalid, that is, denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent. Now, a few points to mop up this type of argument. First, when we talk about denial of the antecedent or denial of the consequent, we have in mind a point of logic, not a point of grammar. It doesn't make any difference where the word not occurs. Whatever comes after the if is called the antecedent and is symbolized simply by P, whether it has a knot in it or not. Let me take down this example, and you'll see the point that I mean. If a man is not logical, then he is not happy. Suppose that's your hypothetical premise. If a man is not logical, then he is not happy. And your next premise is, this man is happy. And you draw the conclusion, therefore, this man is logical. Is there something that can be done about the music that's coming in? You got that. If this man is not logical, then he is not happy. He is happy. Conclusion. Therefore, he is logical. Now, if you were symbolizing this argument, you would simply say, the antecedent, the part that comes right after the if is, this man is not logical. There's no reason to put a P prime there. It's simply a plain ordinary P. That's the antecedent. That's what comes after the if. And for he is not happy, you would have simply a Q. That's your consequence. Now, when you come to the second premise and it tells you he is happy, that is the denial of the, uh, of the what? Consequent, right. In which case, you would simply put down for your symbol Q prime, and your conclusion would be P prime. The fact that the not is in one clause or the other doesn't make any difference. When we say denial of the antecedent, the premise that does the denial may be affirmative in form. We are focused on the logical relation. Whenever your second premise tells you the antecedent, however formulated, isn't so, then it's called denying the antecedent or denying the consequent, as the case may be. Now, it would be very simple to work these, and there would be no point, really, to having to worry about elaborating this uh, terminology if people walked around and said, if this man has worked hard, uh, then he is tired. But this man has worked hard, therefore this man is tired. It would be all pretty clear cut. Unfortunately, people do not walk around. Well, I don't know whether unfortunately or there are certain stylistic desirability in not walking around talking like that. In any event, people uh, um, disguise the structure of their line, uh, of their argument in a whole welter of different ways of speaking. And therefore, in conjunction with each type of argument, there is usually a series of tips on how to translate from the way people actually speak into what we have now worked out as the standard form. The if-then form that we just worked out in four versions is the standard form of the mixed hypothetical. But now let's figure out how do you translate when people mean that, but they don't literally say it, from the way people speak 
into this standard form. And the first major point to make under this is what do you do when people say only if P, then Q? Now, as I pointed out to you when we were discussing the validity of these various forms, the statement only if P, then Q is a distinct statement entirely from the statement if P, then Q. For instance, if I tell you only if there is oxygen, can there be a fire? That doesn't mean if there is oxygen, there is a fire. If I tell you only if you come to class, will you pass? That doesn't say if you come to class, you will pass. If I say only if you're a veteran, are you eligible for this award? That is not the same as saying if you're a veteran, you're eligible. The only statement, when it's only if, is the reverse of the if statement in the following way. The if statement, without the only, just the if P then Q, gives you a sufficient condition. The only statement gives you a necessary condition, but it may not be sufficient. When you say only if P then Q, you are saying P is a necessary condition for Q. You can't get Q without P, but it doesn't tell you yet that P is sufficient, that it's enough. Maybe something else is required. Now, we worked out our rules only for plain if-then statements. Consequently, we need some way of translating only statements into a plain if-then form without the word only. And yet, of course, we have to keep exactly the same meaning. And so we now have to ask ourselves, how do you take a statement that's of the form only if P then Q and rewrite it with the identical meaning but without any only? keeping simply the same meaning. Well, obviously, we can't just drop the only because we'll change the meaning, so we have to do something. And as a matter of fact, you have two different choices, which are completely optional. Two different translations for statements which contain only. Consider the statement, only if you attend classes do you pass the course. That means one or the other equally of two different things. One possibility you could translate it as, if you do not attend classes, then you do not pass. In other words, we would simply drop the only and negate both constituents. In other words, if you want to write down an abstract equation to cover that, you could say only P implies Q, using that little horseshoe for implies, only P implies Q, is the same as, give it to me in symbolic form now, P prime implies Q prime. Only P implies Q is the same as P prime implies Q prime. Now I say you have two choices. The other thing you could do if you wanted to get rid of the only is consider back to the content example. Only if you attend classes do you pass. Well, then from that we are entitled to say, if you passed, then you attended classes. In that case, what did we do? We dropped the only and reversed the order of the two constituents. If we put that abstractly, you can put it down this way. Only P implies Q is the same as Q implies P. So, just to take an example, taking the oxygen example, only if there's oxygen is there a fire. You could rewrite that. If there's not oxygen, then there's not a fire. Or, if there's a fire, then there was oxygen. Only if you're a veteran are you eligible. If you're eligible, then you're a veteran. If you're not a veteran, then you're not eligible. Putting it now, uh, you want to just have it in ordinary English. If you want to get rid of an only, you have two choices. You either drop it and negate the two constituents, or you drop it and reverse the two constituents. Either drop the only and negate the two, or drop the only and reverse the two. Now, 
I want to emphasize this point so you won't be taken in by uh, this, I, but I don't want to overemphasize it. Uh, sometimes students get so traumatized that if anybody at three in the morning says the word only to them, they stand up and begin to reverse or negate. <coughs> this is only applicable if, see it's only applicable if the only precedes the if. And if it's the statement is only if something, then something, then this rule is, is applicable, but you should not become panic-stricken in the face of an ordinary only. This rule applies only if the only if goes together. Got it? So when you're working an argument of which one of the premises is only if, you take your option. Whichever one you want, it makes no difference. Now there are a few further tips on translating, as it's called, from English into standard form. There are many words in English which in various contexts serve as synonyms for if, and you have to be on the alert for them and simply rewrite substituting if for the word. For instance, when can substitute for if. When men think, then they prosper. There's obviously a conditional idea, if men think then they prosper. Where can very often function as meaning if. Where there is science, there is wealth. Obviously, again, it's a conditional. If there is science, there is wealth. Provided that is a nice two words to use to mean simply if. On the condition that, assuming that, etc. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole lexicography of synonyms for if, but the idea is if you get the conditional idea in the premise, one thing depends on another, translated into if. Sometimes in ordinary language, the two will be presented to you in reverse order. For instance, a statement like this, he will pass if you motivate him. Now, how would you rewrite that to simply get it in standard form? If you motivate him, then he'll pass. You just put the if part at the beginning. I might just call attention to the word unless. Unless you study, you fail. What does unless mean? No, unless does not mean only. Unless you study, you fail. Does not mean only if you study, you fail. Unless actually means if not. If not. So when you have unless you study, you fail, you just write if you do not study, you fail. Now, the best thing is to go by the common sense meaning and not memorize a hundred tips of translation. There's over one point before we take our break from this type of argument, and that is, when you're analyzing an argument, you cannot assume that the last statement offered is the conclusion. In ordinary speech and writing, people are free to either state their conclusion first, in the middle, or at the end. Thus, take the classic Socrates argument that I've been using. I could say to you, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. In which case my conclusion is obviously at the end. But suppose I came in and I said, Socrates is mortal, because all men are mortal and Socrates is what? Then my first statement was the conclusion. Or I could stick it in the middle. I could say all men are mortal, so Socrates must be, because he is one, in which case my conclusion is sandwiched between my two premises. Now, how do you tell which are the premises and which are the conclusion of an argument? That's obviously crucial. You cannot assume that whichever order it's stated in, the last one is the conclusion. Well, there are certain words in English which are called logical indicators. Logical indicators because they indicate whether the sentence that comes after them is premise or conclusion. And these are very obvious. I'll give you just a few. The following are logical indicators that introduce conclusions. Therefore, thus, so, as a result, I conclude, hence, Consequently, you get the idea, I don't have to multiply that, uh, but all of those words should make you light up and say, aha, what's coming is the conclusion. On the other hand, all the following words and phrases 
indicate that what follows is a premise for FOR. Because, since, on the grounds that, on the premise that, my reason is, etc. There's a whole bunch of them. Now, whenever you see any such words as those, you know that what's coming is a premise. If there are no indicators at all, and the person simply walks in and says, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, then you have to assume, for lack of anything, that the last one is his conclusion. But in almost all cases, there are some indicators to suggest what's premise and what's conclusion. Now, just before we take the break, you want to take down these steps in working an argument. You should follow these steps in this order, in any argument you want to analyze. First, find the conclusion. Now, I emphasize this because in my experience, about one-third of people assume automatically the last sentence is the conclusion, and then they, of course, throw the whole argument down the drain because they're not analyzing the right argument. Decide what the conclusion of the argument is first. And then second, write out the premises and conclusion in standard form. Write out the premises and conclusion in standard form. Now, in connection with the mixed hypothetical, the standard form will be if antecedent, then some consequence, and then whatever your second premise is and whatever your conclusion is. So that means get rid of the only, get rid of the unless, do all the translation till you have it in standard form. Now, at the beginning, you're well advised to do that writing out in full. If this man has worked hard, then he is tired. If you find that you get bored, reduce it to if worked hard. And if that, you get too up on it and you can't take that much writing, make it just if worked. And if even that's too much, write if W-O or even if W, as long as you remember what it stands for. But that's fine. You can condense them into simply as brief a thing as you want. The only tip I give you is that if you abbreviate, do it consistently. So if you're going to write work for the first antecedent, then when it comes up again if in the next premise, say, write work again. Use the same abbreviation so you know what you're doing. And, uh, all right, then the third step, symbolize. Now, to symbolize, you always put parentheses around the words that your symbol stands for. And those parentheses indicate to you that the symbol stands for everything between the parentheses. Now, notice, in this type of argument, the if and the then are not part of the uh, a word that, a phrase that the symbol stands for. They are the structural elements that tell you the relationship. So the parentheses come simply around the antecedent and the consequent, in this case. And, of course, the word therefore is simply a logical indicator introducing the conclusion. It's not part of the conclusion. So put your symbols on, and as part of that same step, collect the symbolic structure over on the side, just in the way we have done in the booklet here. And then, finally, name the form and state whether it's valid or invalid. Name the form and state whether it's valid or invalid. So you'd say, for instance, affirming the antecedent, valid. Denying the antecedent, invalid. The fallacies in this case are only two, and they're the same name as the name of the form. Denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent. All right, let's take a short break here, and then we'll go on to some other types of art. All right, we've now looked at the mixed hypothetical argument, and if you turn now on page 14 to number 3, you will see an example of a different type of argument. Now, for a moment, ignore the symbols and just look at the content of the argument. Number three on page 14. If a person is young, then he is enthusiastic. If he is enthusiastic, then he is diligent. Conclusion, therefore, if a person is young, then he is diligent. Now, in this case, both premises and the conclusion are all the same type of statement, namely which? A hypothetical statement. Consequently, if you had to give a name to this type of argument, where every ingredient is a hypothetical statement, 
what would you call it to distinguish it from a mixed hypothetical argument, which is a mixture of a hypothetical and non-hypothetical, and this is purely hypothetical, and guess what it's called? A pure hypothetical. Very clever. Right. This is a pure hypothetical argument. <clears throat> now notice it's an argument. It has premises and a conclusion. In this case, the conclusion is if a person is young, then he's diligent, which obviously is something which requires proof and which these premises purport to prove. Now, we are not here concerned with the truth of the premises or conclusion, but simply this is a structure of premises leading to a conclusion, but every one of them is hypothetical in its form, and so the argument as a whole is pure hypothetical. Now, I've symbolized it for you right on there. Take our first antecedent of the first premise, a person is young, we stick parentheses around it and call it P. And the consequent, he is enthusiastic, Q. When we come to he is enthusiastic in the second premise, obviously we call it again Q, because that's what Q stands for. And now we have a chance for inventiveness and creativity, because we see he is diligent, which never came up in the argument before. So we take a plunge into the unknown and symbolize it by R. And then we put the appropriate symbols in the conclusion, the P and the R, and collect the symbols at the side, and you see the structure is P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore P implies R. Or if P, then Q, if Q, then R, Therefore, if P, then R. Now, is this argument, this particular version, number three, valid or invalid? Remembering that valid means only the conclusion follows from those premises, not necessarily that the conclusion is true, because we're leaving aside the question, are the premises true? Is this reasoning valid? How many say yes? You are correct. This is what is known as a chain argument, simply called a valid chain, because the structure is, the Q in this particular case is simply the link joining up the P and the R. P leads to Q, and Q leads to R, then P must lead to R. So it simply is a simple chain, with Q serving as the middle link. The P is connected to the Q, the Q to the R, therefore the P to the R. Now there's nothing very complex about this one. In this case, however, that is to say, in discussing a pure hypothetical argument, there's no reason why you have to restrict yourself to two premises. In a mixed hypothetical argument, you always have simply two premises, one hypothetical, one categorical. But in this type, you can go on as long as you want, and it will remain valid no matter how long you go on, so long as you don't break the chain, for instance. Suppose we took the two premises we have right here. If a person is young, then he's enthusiastic. If he's enthusiastic, then he's diligent. And I added to it. And if he's diligent, then he's productive. And if he's productive, then he's wealthy. I added two more premises. What conclusion could I come to from those four premises? If a person is young, then he is wealthy. Obviously, I can have as many links as I want, so long as I do not break the chain. Each new link will get a new letter, and if you want to take it down, if we had four premises, let me just give it to you symbolically so you can see a big chain before your eyes. Put these down one underneath the other. P implies Q, Q implies R, R implies, let's be brave and call it S, S implies T, and let's stop there out of sheer fatigue. And our conclusion would therefore be P implies T. Now, any argument like this, no matter how long it is, as long as the chain is nowhere broken, is valid. Now, how do we know whether the chain is broken? Well, you can formulate the rule abstractly like this. The antecedent of the first premise, in this case, P, has to be the antecedent of the conclusion. The consequent of the last premise has to be the consequent of the conclusion. And in between, no matter how far you go, 
the last one of one premise must be the first one of the next. So if Q is the consequent of the first premise, it must be the antecedent of the next. If R is that consequent, it must be the antecedent of the next. If S is that consequent, it must be the antecedent of the next. So long as you have a structure in which the very first one is identical to the very first one in the conclusion, and the very last one is identical to the very last one in the conclusion, and in between you have these linked up pairs, two Q's, two R's, two S's, however you've got, you can go on indefinitely, and it simply is a valid chain. If you want another name, there's no reason to know this name but for cocktail party purposes, but if you want it, when an argument has more than two premises, a deductive argument, it's called a sorites, S-O-R-I-T-E-S. So in the one we just gave you, P implies Q, Q implies R, R implies S, etc., that would be called a pure hypothetical sorites. But you don't really gain anything by calling it that. Now, when is a pure hypothetical argument invalid? Well, whenever the chain is broken, in which case it has the technical name, the fallacy of a broken chain. Now, let me dictate to you a simple example of an invalid, pure hypothetical. And again, I'll give it to you in shorthand rather than put in all the grammar. If doctor, by which I mean you are a doctor, if you are a doctor, then school, meaning you went to school. If doctor, then school, which is simply shorthand for if you're a doctor, then you went to school. Second premise, if lawyer, then school. Conclusion I want to come to. If doctor, then lawyer. Now that is a pure hypothetical argument, but a miserable one. It's a broken chain. If you symbolize that, you'd put P for doctor, Q for school, R for lawyer, Q for school again, and then P for doctor and R for lawyer. If you collected the symbols on the side, what would you have? P implies Q, R implies Q, therefore P implies R. Now you see at a glance there is no chain there. What would my second premise have had to be for this argument to be able to be valid? It would have to be, if I could say Q implies R, then I would have P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore P implies R. But of course I can't because Q implies R in this case would mean if you went to school then you're a lawyer. And obviously that simply is too implausible and the person did not mean it. Uh, he, he meant if you are a lawyer then you went to school, not the reverse. Therefore this is a clear example of a broken chain. If you look at number four on the sheet, there is another example simply of the same fallacy, the fallacy of a broken chain. Slightly different kind of break here, but it's still a broken chain. If a man is a doctor, then he's been to school. If a man has not been to school, then he's ignorant. Conclusion, therefore, if a man is a doctor, then he's ignorant. As a pure hypothetical argument, we put the symbols on, the P, Q, Q primed R, P, R, Q prime, because obviously that's the negation of he has been to school, it's he has not been to school. Collect the symbols on the side, and there's our structure. P implies Q. Q prime implies R. Therefore, P implies R. Where did it go off? Obviously, the Q and Q prime do not match in this case. If our premise was, our first premise had been P implies Q prime, then the argument would be okay. If our second premise was Q implies R, the argument would be all right. But these premises, do not yield this conclusion. We broke the chain by having that uh, Q and Q prime in that succession. Now, however the chain is broken, it's simply called the fallacy of the broken chain. So all you do when you get these arguments is symbolize, collect, and see. Do you have a valid chain, or has it been broken? Now, there's only one difficulty in working pure hypothetical arguments, and that is there are many cases in which the chain at first glance appears to be broken. So it looks as though it's an invalid argument.
but actually there is a perfectly valid chain. There, only it is disguised. And by suitable tinkering and reformulation, you can bring out the fact that there is a real structure there, a real valid structure, and show that the argument is valid. Now, I'd like to caution you. It is not true that all pure hypothetical arguments are valid. It is not true that if you're ingenious enough in tinkering with them, you can take anything that anybody says and make it valid. But it is sometimes true that an argument may appear to be invalid, a pure hypothetical argument, and yet it really is valid if you play around with it. That is, do legitimate things to it, only reveal the chain that's actually there. Now, in this connection, I give you three helpful tips in playing around with a chain before you say it is invalid. Tip number one. The premises may not have been presented in the right order. You're always free to change the order of the premises. And it may be the case that you can show the chain only by making the second premise come first or the tenth premise come eighth or whatever it happens to be. There's nothing sacrosanct about the order of premises. Second tip. Watch out for onlys, which can appear in pure hypotheticals just as in plain mixed hypothetical cases. And whenever you have an only if, your eye should light up. You seize on the only and you remember, you've got to get rid of this only and you have two choices. What, what are the two choices again to remind you? You drop the only and you either negate or you reverse. Right. Uh, you must get rid of the only because the chain is not defined with reference to an only. So you can take your pick, and sometimes you'll find negating both is just what you need, and sometimes you'll find reversing both is just what you need, and sometimes it's hopeless, because the argument is invalid. Now I'm going to have the temerity to give you one more tip. I say temerity because I don't want you to break down altogether in the face of these formulae, but one is indispensably helpful. I'll just blurt it out bluntly and then explain it. <laughs> Whenever you have a statement, P implies Q. Not only in that, right? Forget about only now. Just plain, ordinary P implies Q. You are always entitled to rewrite that. Not Q implies not P. In other words, if you want to write down a formula that will always hold, P implies Q is identical in meaning to Q prime implies P prime. For instance, if you're a man, notice there's no onlys here. If you're a man, then you're mortal. That is identical to if you're not mortal, then you are not a man. I reverse and negate. If you study, then you pass, is identical to, if you don't pass, then you didn't study. Reverse and negate. If you're poor, then you're hungry. Let's suppose that's true. Then, if you're not hungry, then you're not poor. As a general principle, you're always entitled, when you deal with a straight if-then statement, to reverse and negate. Now the whole trick is simply keeping in mind the difference between what you do to get rid of onlys and what you do when you use this rule. When you have only if, you drop the only and you either reverse or negate. When you want simply to rewrite a statement, you both reverse and negate. That's applicable only when there are no onlys. Got that? Now, look at number five. I deliberately concocted one that looks hopeless. Now, if I just came in the room and said, this is five page 14, <coughs> only if you are not rich do you not pay high taxes. If you don't succeed, you're not persistent. If you do succeed, you're rich. Therefore, if you're persistent, you pay high taxes. 
Valid or not? Now, no one can tell. It's all mixed up. There is no way to tell. So this is how you work. I mean, no way to tell just by looking at it. This is how you work this type of art. To begin with, you just go along in order and stick on letters. However they come, put parentheses whenever you get an antecedent and go on from there. Now, the first thing that should leap out at you here from the first sentence is only. So you just underscore it or something so it doesn't disappear from your mind. Remember that and leave out the if and you come now to some words. You are not rich. Okay, that's the first thing we hit. We call that P. In this case, the then was left out in ordinary English, uh, but you, it's implied. And then we've got, you don't pay high taxes, Q. And we continue merrily on our way. You do not succeed. R, you are not persistent. S, now we see you do succeed. And we remember that we used R for you do not succeed. So for you do succeed would be R prime. You are rich. We had P for you are not rich. And therefore we put P prime. And our conclusion, therefore, if you are persistent, is the negation of what we had S stand for. So it's S prime. You pay high taxes is the negation of you don't. So it's Q prime. Then we collect our symbols on the side. Now remember, we carry the only across. So our symbols read only. P implies Q. R implies S. R prime implies P prime. Therefore, S prime implies Q prime. Now the question is, can we make a valid chain? This is the information the premises give us, reduced to its structural content, as we've thrown out the words and simply reduced it to its structure. And the question is now, do those three premises yield that conclusion? Now, on the face of it, you can't tell. But now we start applying our rules. Now, if we want to yield a conclusion, S prime implies Q prime. That's the conclusion we want to come to. We know right off the bat that the first premise must begin with what antecedent? S prime, if we're going to construct a valid chain. <coughs> so we look, hopefully, at the premises we're given, and we ask, is there an S prime there? No, very disappointing. So we think maybe we're lost. But before we give up, we say, well, is there an S? If there's no S, then, of course, you simply go to the movies. It's hopeless. <laughs> but <clears throat> if there is an S, you have a hope. Is there any way of making that S into the antecedent and also making it negative? Because we want to start with S prime. And then your eye lights on which of the three premises? The second. You see, R implies S, and you think to yourself, Whenever you have an implication, you can always reverse and negate. So in this case, you would simply say, I'm going to translate R implies S into S prime implies R prime. Now write that down on top somewhere. Write S prime implies R prime. And now cross out the R implies S because you've used that information already. Now we know, of course, that if we're to continue the chain, the next premise must begin with what antecedent? R prime. Do we have one? Ah, there, number three is already perfect. It's right in the form we need. It starts with R prime, so we just copy that and change its order from premise three to premise two, and write down R prime implies P prime. Now we have, all, and you cross out the one we just used up. All we need now is one more premise. And we know that if the argument is to be valid, it has to start, this last premise has to start with what antecedent? P prime. And it has to have what consequent at the end? Q prime, because that's the consequent of the conclusion. We need P prime implies Q prime. We have only one thing left. Only P implies Q. Now you think to yourself, well, if it's only P implies Q, I know I'm always allowed, when I have an only, to do one or the other of two things, either reverse or negate. Now, in this case, it would obviously be the height of perversity <laughs> to choose to reverse the two. You would obviously, in this case, avail yourself of the option of negating the two. 
So you simply drop the only and write P prime implies Q prime. And then just write in the conclusion as it is. And now you look at what you've written. You haven't changed the original meaning at all. You kept exactly to the information given in the premises. And you now have it in the form. S prime implies R prime. R prime implies P prime. P prime implies Q prime. Therefore, S prime implies Q prime. Perfect chain. Now, therefore you say a valid argument in the sense that the conclusion follows from the premise. Now, you are in a position to figure out in English, what was the guy saying? <laughs> you simply translate your chain back into English now that you've worked out the structure. And we know that S prime here means persistent, right? R prime means uh, succeed. P prime means rich. We're just reading off what we put in originally. And Q prime means what? pay high taxes. Therefore, reading, sub substituting words for our new st statement of the symbols, we get like this. If you are persistent, then you succeed. If you succeed, then you're rich. If you're rich, then you pay high taxes. Therefore, if you are persistent, then you pay high taxes. And you get the logic of the argument before you perfectly clearly, and then you can, if you want, challenge a particular premise if you think it's invalid because you know exactly what the structure of the reasoning is. So one of the values of this is not only to determine the validity but to figure out what actually is the meaning of the argument because if it gets long enough and complex enough you simply can't hold it in mind in the way it's originally presented. Now there are a couple like this on the exercises which I'll assign at the end of this lecture, a few chains like this for you to play with. All right, let us look at one more type of argument this evening in our introduction to deduction. This is called an alternative argument. <clears throat> and number six and seven on page 15 are examples of alternative arguments. Look at number six. It has an alternative premise, either he is bored or he is dense said, for instance, about a student in a class who does poorly. The second premise is a categorical. He is not bored in this case. The conclusion, he is dense, is a categorical. Now, this type of argument is known simply as an alternative argument. You do not have to call this a mixed alternative argument, because there is no pure alternative argument. If somebody says either P or Q, either Q or R, you say that's nice, but nothing follows. There is no argument which follows from two alternatives, and consequently we don't have to say a mixed alternative, simply an alternative argument. Now, the question is, under what circumstances are alternative arguments valid? They always have one alternative premise, one categorical premise, and a categorical conclusion. Unfortunately, before we can discuss the rules of the validity of this type of argument, we have to distinguish two different kinds of alternative statements. These two types are referred to, respectively, as strong alternate, a strong alternation, and guess what the other one is called? Weak, very good. Strong alternation and weak alternation. And I must first explain this distinction before we can discuss the arguments. This distinction comes from the fact that either or, that phrase in English, can have two different meanings. It is ambiguous. And in some languages, such as Latin, there are two different words to stand for, the, for or, depending upon which meaning it has. Consider first a statement like this. Either he is still alive or he is dead. What does the either-or tell you in a case like that? It tells you that one or the other is true, but both can't be true, right? The two are mutually exclusive. If he's alive, he's not dead. If he's dead, he's not alive. It's one or the other, but not both. Or to switch the example, if I say to you, either your martini is dry or it's sweet. That's the same type 
of uh, alternation, still strong alternation. I'll explain why it's called strong in a few minutes, but uh, it means one or the other, but not both. The two are mutually exclusive. They can't both be true. Now, the symbol for that, uh, the way we use the horseshoe for if-then, when we want to symbolize strong alternation, if you look at the sheet, number seven is an example of that. And you will see two Vs, one inside the other, taken from the Latin word for or, which is vel. Now, when you have two Vs, one inside the other like that, they don't have to be that big, but that's how they came out here. When you have two Vs, that is the signal for strong alternation. It means one is true or the other is true, but both can't be. At least one, at most one. Now, on the other hand, consider weak alternation, which is a different meaning to the statement either or. A student does poorly in class. And several alternatives come to mind. I think to myself, either he's bored, or he's dense, or I might think several others. And I utter the statement, either he's bored or he's dense. Now, in that context, I want to leave open the possibility that maybe several of these things are true. If we restrict ourselves to just the two cases of being bored or dense, my thought is either he's bored or he's dense or possibly both. And yet I can express that same thought in English by just thinking aloud, either he's bored or he's dense. But there I do not want to say they're mutually exclusive, that at most one is true. I want to say, well, these are various possibilities. It's either one or the other, and maybe both. Or your electric typewriter stopped working, and you mused to yourself, well, let's see, either the plug came out or some part broke down, or maybe both. That, again, would be weak alternation. Now, a weak alternation is symbolized, I'll explain why it's called weak shortly, but it's symbolized with just one V, as in number six on page 15. When you see a single V like that, it means either P or Q, and possibly both. The premise doesn't say, the person doesn't commit himself. Now, in legal uh, terminology, there is an exact expression to capture the meaning of weak alternation when you want to say one or the other, and possibly both. And what is the expression that's used in contracts and generally legal uh, discussion to capture that idea, one or the other, and possibly both? And or, and hyphen or. P and or Q. <clears throat> now these have, of course, two very different meanings. And consequently, we have separate rules of validity. If your premise is a weak, alternative, or if your premise is a strong one. Let's first work out the rules for weak alternation. Now, again, there'll be four forms of it, but I only put one down on your sheet. Number six on page 15 is an example of weak alternation. Either he's bored or he's dense, then I say he's not bored, I conclude he is dense. Now, first, a point of terminology. Is the phrase, he is bored, in the first premise, is that the antecedent? No. This is not an if-then statement. Consequently, the terminology of antecedent and consequent is no longer applicable. All you say about he is bored is it is one of the alternants, A-L-T-E-R, N-A-N-T. It is the first alternate, but there's really no use saying whether it's first or second because it doesn't make any difference which order they're presented. But you simply say it's one alternate, and he is dense would be another alternate. Don't call them antecedent and consequent, otherwise you're going to mix up the rules for alternatives with the rules for hypotheticals, and then you won't know what to do with yourself. Uh, all right, as far as the symbolizing is concerned, we simply leave the either or out, because that's the structural element here. Put parentheses around the first alternate, call it P. Around the second, call it Q. Premise, he's not. Board, the second premise would be P prime. The conclusion, he is dense, is Q. Collected on the side using a V now, because it's weak alternation, and so we get P, V, Q, 
which means either P or Q, possibly both. P isn't true, therefore Q is. And this is the first, as I say, of four possible forms of weak alternation. Is this form vowel? Yes, this form is vowel. Because the premise tells you one or the other, maybe both, but at least one must be true. Well, if then the next premise tells you P is not true, you are entitled to conclude Q must be true because the premise said one or the other at minimum has to be true. Maybe both, but at least one. Well, if P is not true, then obviously Q is true. Therefore, that is vowel. Now, I'll dictate to you another form. And again, I'll use shorthand. It's still weak alternation. Write down. Either board or dance. And then the second premise, board. In other words, he is board. Conclusion, not dance. Now, how many think that one is valid? How many think it's invalid? Yes, you are correct. That one would be symbolized P, V, Q. P, therefore, Q prime. And that is invalid. Why? Because this is weak alternation. Therefore, the premise tells you one or the other, and possibly both. Therefore, if your second premise tells you, well, P is true, you can't conclude anything about Q, because maybe both are true. Maybe not, maybe so, but you don't know. Therefore, from the second premise telling you that one of the alternates is true, you can't conclude anything about the other one. Therefore, it's invalid. Now let's work it with the Qs, right down. Either board or dance. Dance is your second premise. Therefore, not board. Now that would be P, V, Q. Q, therefore, P prime. Is that valid? No, for the same reason. Weak alternation, one or the other, possibly both. From the fact that Q is true, you cannot then infer that P is not, because maybe both. Take down the last form. Either bored or dense. Not dense. Conclusion, therefore, bored. Symbolically, that would be P, V, Q, Q prime, therefore, P. Is that valid? Yes, for the same reason that the first one was. The premise tells you one or the other, possibly both, but at least one. Well, then, if we know Q is not true, we are entitled to conclude P must be true. So we have two valid and two invalid forms. And you can easily enough keep it in mind if you want to simply take down which are valid and which are not in the following. Here's the rule which I'll dictate to you for weak alternation. It is valid whenever the categorical premise denies one alternate and the conclusion affirms the other. I'll repeat. It is valid whenever the categorical premise denies one alternate and the conclusion affirms the other. It's always valid because the premise tells you one or the other and maybe both, but at least one. Therefore, if your next premise tells you well, one isn't true, one you deny, the other must be. But it is always invalid when the reverse happens. In other words, it is always invalid in weak alternation when the categorical premise affirms one alternate and the conclusion denies the other. Want to write that down? It is invalid when the categorical premise affirms one alternate and the conclusion denies the other, then it is invalid, because the meaning of weak alternation is one or the other and possibly both. 
And therefore, the fact that you know that one of them is true doesn't permit you to come to any conclusion about the other. Now, it is very unfortunate but true that the fallacy, the name of the fallacy in the two cases which are invalid, happens to be the name of the type of argument. It's simply called the fallacy of weak alternation in the two cases where it's fallacious. Now, that's unfortunate terminology because it makes it sound like any weak alternative argument is invalid. That's not true. There's two valid forms of it. But in those cases where it's invalid, it happens to receive the name simply the fallacy of weak alternation. Same fallacy. There's not two different names as there is in the mixed hypothetical counterpart. Now look at number seven on page 15, and there is an argument which has a strong altern alternative as its premise. Either he is still alive or he is dead. He's still alive, therefore he's not dead. Now we take that to be strong, meaning either P or Q, but not both. One must be true at minimum. One can be true at maximum. At least one, at most one can be true. Now, in this case, you don't really have to bother working out the rules because if you are not hopelessly psychotic, you can go wrong. I mean, for instance, if you say either he's still alive or he's dead. He is still alive, therefore Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo. That obviously is invalid. But anything within the realm of plausibility, you cannot go wrong in strong alternation. If you say, for instance, he's still alive, then you can infer he's not dead. Because you know uh, one or the other, but not both. Therefore, from one being true, you can infer the other isn't true. If you say he's dead, you can, in your second premise, you can conclude he's not alive. Same reasoning. They can't both be true. So if one is true, the other can't be. If you say he isn't alive, you negate one. Well, then, of course, you can infer he is dead. It's one or the other. At minimum, one must be true. And if you say he isn't dead, then you can conclude, therefore, he is alive again. In other words, you are always free because of the nature of strong alternation. The premise tells you at least one is true and at most one is true. Therefore, if your second premise affirms one, your conclusion can deny the other. If your second premise denies one, your conclusion can affirm the other. So in general, you simply can't go wrong, uh, as I say, in any normal case. Now, the whole trick with weak uh, and strong alternative arguments is how to tell which is which. When is it intended as a weak, and when is it intended as strong? In most cases, you can tell from the content. For instance, if it's either a person is alive or dead, you can tell it's obviously those are mutually exclusive. In those cases where you can't tell from the content, usually the person will tell you from the context or by adding some phrase like, and maybe both, or but not both, or something to give you a clue. But we have to have a policy on what to do if there's absolutely no way of telling. If you can't tell from either the content or the context or any other signs, is it weak or strong? The rule is we always assume that it is weak. You always assume that it is weak if you can't tell from any information available to you. We assume that because the weak interpretation commits the person who said it to less information. It is the minimum meaning of either or. And if we don't know what the speaker intended when he said the either or, we want to take the bare minimum that he must have intended and not ascribe to him a commitment beyond what he intended. And this is why the weak version is called weak and the strong version is called strong. The strong gives you more information than the weak. The weak simply tells you if either is false, the other is true. But the weak does not tell you if either is true, the other must be false. It leaves open, maybe both. On the other hand, on a strong interpretation, you are told if either is true, the other must be false. If either is false, the other must be true. You're given twice the information, in other words. That's why it's called a strong alternative. It gives you twice as much information. Consequently, we uh, adopt the rule. If we don't know which the speaker meant, the minimum he must have meant is what's involved in the weak statement and therefore we interpret it as weak in the absence of any other uh, information. 
Now, I have one final point before we leave this, and I make a preface. Sometimes the following point, which I'm about to make, which take about two minutes, students find helpful. They find that it unifies all these arguments and it gives them a breakthrough sense of freedom. Sometimes, however, it is the last straw which causes them to teeter over the edge and lose the entire hour and a half. So I give you this warning in advance. If you feel that you are being overloaded and the point which I am about to make is in imminent danger of collapsing everything from the beginning tonight, simply tune it out. Do not listen to it. It is not crucial. You can be, live your whole life perfectly logically and analyze every argument without knowing it. Now with that premise, with that warning, I mention in a diffident way that you can if you want, but you don't have to. But if you want, you can always transform an alternative statement into a hypothetical. And therefore, if you don't like working alternative arguments, you can convert them into mixed hypotheticals. And now I'm about to tell you how to do it. Do you have the statement, either we resist aggression or we shall be conquered? That's an either or. How would we rewrite that same meaning? You can't change the person's meaning. But in an if-then form, either we resist aggression or we shall be conquered. Assume that's weak. It's one or the other. Maybe both. Maybe our resistance won't be successful, but at least one of these two. How would you rewrite that in a hypothetical form? Either we resist aggression or we shall be conquered. Well, if you think about it, you'll see. Uh, it would be, if we do not resist aggression, then we shall be conquered. Now, as a general rule, whenever you have PVQ, the single V for weak alternation, you can always rewrite that as P prime implies Q. PVQ can always be rewritten P prime implies Q. In other words, putting it in words, when you have two alternatives put in the weak form, you simply switch from alternation to implication and negate the first, only the first. Now you see why I was hesitant to introduce this, because it starts to swim in some people's minds with the only rule and the other rule, and you get the reversals and negations just start to float free, and then you reach the point of diminishing returns. I won't say how to transform strong alternation uh, into uh, a hypothetical, because there's no reason to do it. Strong alternation arguments never cause any trouble in terms of validity, and so why have two techniques for dealing with them when one isn't necessary to begin with? Uh, but in, in the weak case, if you want, you can switch it into a hypothetical. Now, all you have to do, therefore, I've assigned, uh, I will, I, I now assign on page, I think it starts on page five. There are ten starting on page five and continuing on page six, number one through ten. And those are hypothetical and alternative arguments. Some are mixed hypothetical, some are pure hypothetical, some are alternatives, and I believe I've got some weak alternatives and some strong alternatives. So there's all different kinds all mixed up. And I tried to make them the way you might encounter them in writing or in speech. The first thing you have to do, of course, is decide what kind of argument is it. Is it a mixed hypothetical, a pure hypothetical, or whichever? And then you simply follow the general rules. First, find the conclusion. Look for so, therefore, hence, for, because, etc. Then write it out in standard form. If then, either or, whatever it happens to be. Then symbolize, collect your symbols on the side, and then just simply apply the rules and say whether it's valid or not. Just say this is denying the antecedent, invalid. Fallacy of weak alternation. Strong alternation, valid, whatever uh, it happens to be. I don't think that should take you too long, since there's only 10 of them. And feel free to abbreviate as much as you want if your hand gets tired uh, writing. Just put down the essence. All right, that's where we'll stop for this evening. Next week we will turn to the syllogism of Aristotle. And uh, we'll take a minute or two break, and then we will 
take some accumulated questions and uh, the homework on fallacies that we had from last week. Thank you. Now, before I take up the homework from last week, <coughs> I have a number of accumulated questions that have been collecting across the past weeks. I want to start off by answering some of them. I'll give myself at the outside about 12 or 14 minutes to give some quick answers to as many of these as I think can be answered with relative brevity and would be of general uh, interest, and then we'll spend the rest of the time on the assigned uh, homework. I had a number of people to begin with ask me about the exercise number 15. Remember where he applies to the lawyer? And I said it was valid. Uh, and a number of people argued as follows. They, uh, they said, well, you gave his credentials, but you didn't give any indication of the content of what he said. And uh, you yourself said during the lecture that you have to go not only by the person's credentials, but also by the logic of what he said. And that being so, doesn't, this com doesn't that example in the exercises commit the fallacy of Veracundia? And I would have to say, if you look at it that way, yes, okay. Uh, I did not know any way of indicating briefly in less than four pages the content that the man was communicating or how to show that he was appealing to something that made sense on its own terms. So I simply took for granted that what he said was inter internally plausible. However, if you want to say strictly by what is there on the paper, you don't know. He may have said the most bizarre nonsense, and until you know that it's appeal to authority, then I'd have to say, okay, on that interpretation, call it veracundium. Simply, it's not veracundium if you give them the benefit of the doubt, as I did, to save space. Another question was, please restate the difference between composition and generalization. Now, the difference between composition and generalization is very simple and straightforward. In composition, you start with information already about every individual member of the group, if it's about a group, say. And your inference is to a conclusion about the group as a group. In generalization, you start with information about some individuals in a class, and you end with information about the rest of the individuals in the class. In other words, with a statement about every individual in the class. Generalization is not a fallacy. It's a form of reasoning. It's the essence of induction and it can be valid or invalid, depending upon how you do it. Composition is a fallacy, and it has nothing to do with generalizing. In composition, you do not go from what's true of some to what's true of all. You go from what's true of all as individuals to the claim that that same thing is therefore true of the group as a group, which is an entirely distinct phenomenon. Uh, now, here's a question. Some of these are from a couple of weeks ago, but. I promised I'd save them and get to them when the time came. Is it the fallacy of composition to say that the universe possesses identity on the basis of the following argument? Everything that exists possesses identity, therefore the universe itself possesses identity. Is that an example of a fallacy? And I would say yes, that is certainly an example of a fallacy. If you reason each individual element possesses identity, therefore the total does, as such, should be subject to the uh, 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 fallacy of composition. Any argument which says, therefore, the universe possesses identity, commits right away what fallacy? Fallacy of petitio, of begging the question. You cannot infer the law of identity from anything else because it's the basic law of logic on which all reasoning depends. The way you establish that the universe has identity is not by saying each part has identity, therefore the whole does, but by grasping Aristotle's point when he says that identity is inherent in being qua being. In other words, it is an axiom which is true of anything which exists by the sheer fact that it exists, whether it's a tiny, tiny subpart or the total whole. The same axiom applies. You don't infer the whole from the parts. Whether you're talking on the level of the parts or of the whole, 
The same principle is true. Identity is applicable as a self-evident axiom because it's inherent in being qua being. Here's another one defending the lawyer or saying that uh, it was really Verecundian. This is from a couple weeks ago. Do you regard advertising as of basically undifferentiated products, for instance, cigarettes, deodorant, soap, etc., as necessarily illogical when they attempt to establish associations to their products? Now, I know I took a side swipe at advertising. This was in connection with populum, argumentum ad populum. So let me amend or correct that if it was misleading. I do not regard it as illogical or in any way a fallacy if the purpose of the ad is simply to make the product stand out and remind you of its existence. So if the idea is that you blazon the letters on the screen and have cavorting elephants or whatever, there is nothing in the world fallacious about that. The person is not attempting an argument and therefore can't commit a fallacy. It's just in the nature of a reminder. It becomes a fallacy when the person is trying to insinuate by his advertising an argument which he would not dream of stating explicitly, but which he's trying to get you to accept via emotional connotation. Now, for instance, a certain brand of coffee, I can't remember which it is, but the content of the ad is, if you use this coffee, you will become socially popular or acquire great social prestige. And in other versions with other products, you will achieve sexual success, etc. Now, suppose an, advertis an advertiser just said out on the screen, use this coffee, and become the world's uh, greatest sex symbol. I wouldn't say as such that's a fallacy. I think that's just ridiculous. <laughs> but it wouldn't be any particular fallacy. It'd just be a bizarrely false claim, but they don't do it that way. They simply show the coffee and around it. For instance, there's, a, I don't know, a dozen uh, beautiful girls falling at the feet of the man who's drinking this coffee. So that they're trying to insinuate the uh, attempt not uh, as a straightforward statement, but simply by an emotional association. Now, that's ad populum, because there they're trying to give an argument, but they won't state it. They're counting on emotional uh, arousal. But I don't mean to suggest that every commercial has got to give some formal premises and so on. If they, all they want to do is simply remind you of their product, that's perfectly valid, and no matter how ingenious uh, they do it. Now, here's a question. Uh, pertaining to the discussion we had on, under ignorantium, which I have to guess at the meaning of, but it's worth guessing, so I'm going to try. Is there a difference between the impossible and the not possible? Well, I'd say, on the face of it, my first answer was no. But then I thought about it, and I thought maybe the person means the distinction between the metaphysically impossible and the epistemologically impossible. Now, I don't know. It doesn't sound like that, but if so, let me discourse for about a minute on this distinction. There are certain things which you can say are impossible by the very nature of the phenomenon. A thing which is intrinsically self-contradictory, which involves the existence of a contradiction, you can say is metaphysically impossible. In other words, by the nature of the universe and the fact that the laws of logic are laws of the universe, such a thing can't exist. So, for instance, a round square, you could say, is simply an impossibility under any uh, conditions. It's metaphysically impossible by the nature of the universe. And I would argue, although this is not the place to do it, that any claim to the supernatural, to some dimension, which contradicts and negates this one in which we live, also involves an appeal to a contradiction and is therefore metaphysically impossible. But I would say there are things which are metaphysically possible. In other words, by the nature of the universe, there would be no contradiction in them existing. And yet, you are perfectly entitled in many cases to say about those things, nevertheless, they are epistemologically impossible. In other words, you have no basis whatever for asserting the possibility in this particular case, even though abstractly and under some conditions it might be possible. For instance, take the case I gave during the lecture a couple of weeks ago. I point to someone and say, you have a new undiscovered disease. Now, I said there, you are not entitled to say that's a possibility if there's no evidence. Now, obviously, an, a new undiscovered disease is not in the same category as a round square. It's something which, by its nature, is a possibility. By the nature of the universe, there can be a disease, and a disease that we have not yet discovered. We're discovering them all the time. In that sense, I would say it's a metaphysical possibility. But, I would say, 
Assuming there is no evidence, whatever, in a particular case that it is so, there's no evidence. You're in blooming, glowing, blossoming health. You feel perfectly fine. You've been checked up, etc. And the person simply wanders in out of the blue and gratuitously says, maybe you've got this disease. I would say, in that context, you are still entitled to say, on the basis of the evidence we now have, even though the phenomenon you're talking about is metaphysically possible in the nature of the universe, there is no possibility in this particular case under these circumstances with this evidence. In other words, it is epistemologically impossible. Remember that a metaphysical possibility is always a possibility under some circumstances. Well, if in a particular case all of the evidence uh, it, it points in one direction and there isn't a jot showing even a foothold of a straw of an inkling of a possibility, you are entitled to say even if the phenomenon is not like a round square, it is impossible in this context. Now maybe that's what the original questioner meant by the distinction between the impossible and the not possible, and if not, maybe you, this is illuminating just on its own terms. A couple more fast ones. Is JFK's ask not, uh, you know that statement, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Yes, I got that right. <clears throat> is, is that uh, an example of a false alternative? You bet. <laughs> You have two choices. You serve the country, the country serves you. And the idea of individual self-sustenance and independence is simply left out. Question. Many comedians rely on the use of informal fallacies for their humor. And then the question goes on to ask, is that okay? Certainly. Uh, you can commit fallacies all over the place if the idea is to make the audience laugh. Um, uh, any pun, for instance, is an equivocation, and it's perfectly all right. It's, uh, be it becomes significant to call it a fallacy only if you're trying to prove something. But if you're simply ridiculing uh, uh, something and using a uh, fallacy to expose, to expose it, there's nothing wrong with that. What else might I be able to get in briefly here? Um, would a non-objectivist logician define the fallacy of ignorantium the same way that I did? Uh, that altogether depends on which non-objectivist logician you are talking about. Ignorantium happens to be one of the fallacies which heavily is dependent upon a whole system of epistemology. And I will tell you perfectly openly that I gave you the objectivist interpretation of ignorantium, which varies with what the proper interpretation is depending on your epistemology, your general theory of knowledge. Now, I have seen logicians, for instance, this is particularly true of modern ones, say that ignorantium is any case where you say, you can't show that it exists, therefore it doesn't. You can't show that it doesn't, therefore it does. In other words, they would consider the onus of proof principle, which I defended during the lecture as an example of ignorantium. And they would say, if you reason, there is no proof that such and such exists, therefore it doesn't, you are guilty of ignorantium. Now, I think that is a fantastic interpretation of this fallacy, wipes out its entire basis, and gives you the onus of proving a negative, which I argued last time cannot, or two weeks ago, whenever it was, cannot be done. But yes, uh, I will, should tell you, so you won't be amazed if you read it, that uh, ignorantium, you can get the most ignorant things <laughs> presented in textbooks uh, as uh, examples of ignorant, uh, as the interpretation of ignorantium. And one last quick one, then we'll turn to the exercise. Uh, what led a logician like Aristotle to opt for the unmoved mover as opposed to eternal existence? I just simply want to say for the record, he believed, Aristotle, that the universe was eternal. None of the Greeks, not even Plato, believed that for some period of time there was nothing and suddenly it leaped into being. That is a Judaic and Christian idea, not a Greek idea. All the Greeks believed that the stuff, the material of the universe was eternal, and Aristotle certainly believed that also. His idea of God was not a creator who brought the universe into existence, but a mover who was responsible for keeping things in motion, which is a different proposition. It's also invalid, but he happened to believe that motion required an explanation. This was an error, but, uh, but uh, it was not the error of believing that the universe as, as a whole, as a total, requires uh, an explanation. He, along with all the Greek philosophers, did say 
the universe is eternal. All right, now let us look at the homework that we had from uh, last week. Now, to begin with, before we forget, there was one I dictated to you that I'd like to hear your analysis of. <clears throat> what happens every day is a usual event, but you remember this? But unusual events happen every day. Therefore, unusual events are usual events. What is the, uh, I, and I told you that was equivocation, where is the equivocation in that? Who sees an equivocation in that one? Yes, sir. Uh, the phrase, happens every day. phrase happens every day, yes, that's right. What, explain it briefly, what is the? Well, it happens every day, either particular event happening, happening Day, day one, day three, day three. Right. Or That's exactly correct. The, the gentleman says, happens every day can either mean the same event happens on successive days. For instance, the sun rises on Monday, the sun rises on Tuesday, the sun rises on Wednesday. It happens every day. Or happens every day can mean a different event happens. One on Monday, a different one on Tuesday, for instance. The following are all unusual events. Uh, let us say uh, the birth of uh, quadruplets, a rock slide, and uh, a tidal wave. Now, I could say unusual events happen every day. On Monday, there was a rock slide. On Tuesday, there was a tidal wave. On Wednesday, there was the birth of quadruplets. There, the happens every day doesn't mean the same event occurs Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It means one event occurs Monday, a different one occurs Tuesday, a different one occurs Wednesday. So it's an obvious equivocation. Now, we had one left over from last week, which was number 44, which I didn't want to raise past, even though I'm going to now. Uh, you give an argument, and this is on page 4. And he says, I don't care how powerful your, uh, your reasoning is. You can't be certain. Man is fallible. How do you know that you didn't make a mistake? What fallacy is that one? Yes, sir. No, I think you could be more specific than saying this is miscellaneous. There is a specific fallacy, one of the ones we covered on the aisle at the back, yeah. Ad ignorantium. This is a perfect example of ignorantium. Why? Exactly right. He's demanding that you prove a negative. You've given an argument. He doesn't come and say there's anything wrong with your argument. He simply says, I claim you made a mistake, or maybe you made a mistake. Now prove that you did not. You ask him what mistake? He says, I don't know what mistake. It's up to you to show that you didn't commit an undefined mistake for which there is no evidence. Now there is a clear case that simply can't be done. You cannot prove a negative. You say to him, well, do you think I committed equivocation? If so, where? Show me and I'll show you where you're wrong. Oh no, he says, I got nothing to say positively. I just say, maybe you made a mistake. Now go and show you didn't. It's an obvious impossibility to request to prove a negative. And it does not follow from the fact that man is fallible. From the fact that man is fallible, you conclude only what? It's possible under some circumstances that for men to make mistakes. But if you've just given a good argument and he can't say a word about what's wrong with it, you have given good reason to believe that under these circumstances, your argument is okay. Fallibility does not mean you can never be sure. Fallibility means you have to have an argument in order to be sure. All right, let us turn now to the ones that were specifically assigned for this week. And I believe the first on page one, number, it is page one, isn't it? Yes. Number two, taken from John Stuart Mill. Uh, each person's happiness is a good to that person, and the general happiness, therefore, is a good to the aggregate, to the group as a group. Yes. You say composition. I agree. What? Yes. You say you're starting off with the particular. Each person's happiness. It's true of each person as an individual, he, he says, and let's not, we don't have to argue with that point here. And he concludes, therefore, the good of the whole is of value to the whole as a whole. 
Now, that is a clear case of composition. Now, to anybody who has difficulty distinguishing composition from generalization, I'll make up a different case that would be generalization. If the person argued like this, Mr. A's happiness is of value to him. Mr. B's happiness is of value to him. Mr. C's is to him, etc. And at a certain point, stopped and then said, I generalize. Every individual's happiness is a good to him. That would be generalized. And it might be valid or invalid, depending upon the argument. I think in this case, it would be invalid generalizing. Because I think there are people who don't regard their happiness as a value. But that's a separate question. In this case, he is not generalizing. His premise is... Everybody values his own happiness. That's already a general proposition. And the error is going from what's true of an individual as an individual to the utterly fallacious conclusion that therefore the group as a group must place the group's welfare, uh, which is a pure case of composition. Uh, number five. The American people are fundamentally opposed to violence, etc. The weathermen, and there, of course, I don't have in mind meteorologists, um, are Americans, and therefore they are champions of law and order. What is that? Yes, sir. Absolutely true. It is division. You are going from the collective, the American people as a group, to one particular subgroup within them. This is just like the Japanese spaniel example that I gave during the lecture. And obviously, when you say the American people, you mean as a whole or collectively, as a dominant trend. And that certainly leaves open the possibility that there are advocates of violence and lawlessness who are Americans. So this is simply the reverse of number three. It is division. And now number eight. Nobody is smarter than Einstein. You are smarter than nobody. Therefore, you are smarter than Einstein. Who got that one? Yes, sir. Equivocation on nobody, correct. Why? Well, uh, in the second, between the two premises and the conclusion, it's necessary to treat nobody now in order to draw the conclusion. Well, can you make it clear by translating these first two statements into their actual meaning without using the word nobody? And you'll see that the nobody is smarter than nobody is smarter than Einstein means what? Um, there is no man who is smarter than Einstein. In other words, it means Einstein is the smartest person. Yes. Right. All right. You are smarter than nobody. Anybody is smarter than In other words, you're the dumbest person, right? Now, the nobody there simply functions as a way of telling you which is on top and which is on the bottom. And here's a, the way to tell when you have a real equivocation. If you translate each statement into its meaning and take out the equivocal element, the argument simply collapses. It loses the last veneer of uh, plausibility. So if, if I had come in and simply written, Einstein is the smartest person there is. You are the least smart person there is. Well, obviously, if I conclude from that you're smarter than Einstein, nobody would think at all. It functions on an equivocation, on the assumption that nobody here is a person like Bill, for instance. And so the reasoning was, Bill is smarter than Einstein, and you're smarter than Bill, therefore you're smarter than Einstein. But obviously it's not, doesn't mean that. Number 10. On the front, yes. Yeah. Uh, number 10 is a false alternative. False alternative, you say. I agree. Why? Well, because it gives you two alternatives. Uh, uh, what would a third alternative be? When you say false alternative, you should indicate what other possibility is there. Well, uh, if it's progressive in favor of basically changing the American American political system, or a conservative who believes that nothing in our political system should be changed in any way. All right, so you read me the two as they're listed there, but now what is the third one? To be what you are. To be what you are. In other words, you mean preserve the basic principles of the American system, for instance, but change those elements in our present political system which are in conflict would be one obvious possibility. Now, did anybody say complex question for this? Yes, you could say complex question for this because the person is asking you a question on the implicit assumption that these are the only ones which, uh, when in fact there's another possibility. I myself think, however, that false alternative is a better 
uh, designation for this example because by calling it false alternative, you make clear what is the false assumption in the complex question. You see, so you're a little more specific, and the idea is to try to zero in as carefully as you can on the error. The reason this is a complex question, an unwarranted question, is because it confronts you with a false alternative. And therefore, I think false alternative would be a better answer. Number 11. This is supposedly a real quotation from Marshall Tito. There isn't much difference between America and Yugoslavia. America has two parties and Yugoslavia one, a difference of only one party. And what's that in the scheme of things? What did you get for this? This lady, yes. Use a neglected aspect. Yes, I would certainly accept that. What? Yes, you could certainly say that. He left out one aspect that Yugoslavia is a dictatorship <coughs> and everything, therefore, that is involved in there being one political party is against two totalitarian rule and censorship and all the rest of it. Uh, so in that sense, it's obviously seizing some one fact out of context as though it has no other implications. Yes, in the front. <laughs> Could it be equivocation on the term political party? Because what political party means in this country is not what it means in Yugoslavia. Yes, I would accept that too, because if you take a political party to mean a group of candidates subject to the, uh, or that puts forth, a group that puts forth candidates subject to the vote uh, of the electorate, there is no electorate when there's a one party sta uh, uh, state. There is simply a rubber stamp with a gun held over you explicitly or implicitly, and you get 98 to 99% in favor of it, so really it isn't even the same term. But in a broad sense, if you mean by political party simply, a group of men that put forth the individuals that hold governmental positions, in that broad sense, you could say it's not equivocal. Yes? You want to suggest that it's equivocation on the word difference because difference in the first means the difference between the whole countries and in the second it means only the difference of between two and one parties. I don't think that would be valid because the argument doesn't hinge on that. If all he meant by different is simply not the same without committing himself to to what extent the difference was, the essential fallacy would still remain. Let us look at number 12. This piece of music simply must be beautiful. There is not one ugly phrase in it from start to finish. Now we have to assume that each phrase, in fact, is, uh, is not ugly. What uh, fallacy would this uh, commit? Yes. No, the word, you say there's no fallacy unless the word but changes something. I didn't mean the word but to change anything. So you could simply scrap the but. Now you have to figure out what this thing is saying. It's saying he's heard this piece, and each phrase, let us say by a phrase, he means like a passage of four or five notes. He heard each phrase separately. Let us say he heard Monday one phrase, and it sounds terrific. And then Tuesday he heard the second phrase, five or six notes, and it sounds lovely. And third Wednesday he heard and so on. And he went through the whole concerto, let us say that way, if it's a concerto. At the end he says, well, each phrase by itself sounds lovely. Therefore, I conclude the concerto as a whole is lovely. There is a definite fallacy involved in there. Yes. No, you're on the track, but it's not division. Division would be, uh, you have to keep in mind which direction you're moving. If, if the argument was like this, this piece of music is beautiful as a whole. Therefore, every phrase in it is beautiful. You'd be going from the whole to the part, but here you're going in exactly the opposite direction. Something is true of each part as a part, and therefore to, to the whole as a whole, and that would be composition, right. Um, now you see again how that differs from generalization. In this case, uh, generalization, if the person were to do it, would be to hear, say, six phrases and say they're terrific. I guess all of them are, but that's completely different from um, composition. Uh, number 17. 
Did you have a question on that? Yes. I, I try to keep a certain tempo between staying on one at the point that it's exhausted. So. Isn't there also a whole book that is either beautiful or ugly? Is it a false alternative that it's either beautiful or ugly? If you interpret it that way, I didn't have that in mind. Uh, if you say a, the implication is either a piece is beautiful or it's ugly, when in fact it could be mediocre. So if we wanted to really restrict it to get out that element, it should be reworded. See, the trouble is I try to write them in some way so that they'd have a veneer of plausibility. But if you were to write this to bring out purely the composition, it would have to be each separate phrase by itself, considered as an individual phrase, is beautiful. Therefore, the work itself as a totality is. But as soon as you make it so clear, people don't commit it, you see, so that the fallacies have to be, to a certain extent, disguised. But the thing is to try to pick on the essential. Number 17. My teacher says we should be honest. My neighbor says we should copy. And he wants to resolve the clash of interests. Yes, in the green. Misuse of the mean, right. And why that? Well, you say there's no middle road between honesty and dishonesty. There is a middle road, but the middle road consists of being dishonest in significant part. Uh, but in this case, of course, uh, the fact that it's in the middle has no tendency whatever to show that it's correct. And he's assuming because it's in the middle, it's valid because it's in the middle. All right, uh, so that's misuse of the mean. Number 19, uh, the best advice I can give you about this job interview is be yourself. And the guy says, that's ridiculous. How can I be anything else? And he says, well, I mean be natural. And he says, well, what do you mean I can't be supernatural? Now, what uh, fallacy do you see? I'm trying to get different people. Uh, someone at the very back, I see. I you say it's equivocation on the word natural. All right, I certainly accept that as part of the answer. What are the two senses of natural? When you say equivocation, you have to at least indicate. We don't expect formal definitions, but you have to indicate what is the switch in meaning. When the person originally says be natural, what did he mean? Approximately. In other words, he means don't put on an act, don't put on airs, etc. And the other meaning is the opposite of supernatural. Now, when he told him be natural, he did, he did not mean don't become part of another dimension, <laughs> which is how this person interpreted him, and consequently it's equivocation. Did anybody spot another equivocation in this same argument? Because it has two. Yes. Uh, well, I don't think that can, you say appeal to laughter, but I don't think that the argument rests upon invoking a laugh. It's laughable, but not everything that's laughable is an attempt to get a person to accept a conclusion because of the laugh. And here I think the laugh comes simply as a natural byproduct of the gross equivocation, in part on natural and in part on, yes, yourself. Now, what are the two senses of be yourself? Now, in one sense of be yourself, you can't be anything other than yourself. Be yourself, in that case, means maintain your identity. Be what you are. And about that, you have no choice. The law of identity guarantees that whatever you are, you are. You're always going to be yourself. But be yourself in this connection with the forthcoming job interview means the same as be natural. In other words, in the first sense, don't put on an act, don't put on airs. Just be normal. And of course, that you have control over, and the person is equivocating in his answer. All right, now number 20. 20, I think, is in its own way the trickiest one on this list. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what you do with 20. In a certain sense, I adapted it from Plato, uh, from his dialogue, the Phaedo, but just put it into simplified modern English. What, um, who saw a fallacy in 20? Now, on the face of it, that looks like a plausible argument. Something can't become nothing. The soul is something. And let's here not quibble over soul. Let's say he means by soul something perfectly reputable, like the faculty of consciousness and so on. He doesn't mean 
a mystical entity, so we won't quibble over that. So the soul is something, therefore it can't become nothing. And if it can't become nothing, it'll always exist, so therefore it's immortal. There's two tight lines proving the immortality of the soul. Now, uh, what is wrong with this? Someone that hasn't had a chance before? Yes. You say it's equivocation on what? Equivocation on something. Yes, I agree with that. What is the equivoc What is the two senses of something? In the first statement, you say something refers to an entity, a tangible thing like an apple, etc. And in the second statement, in the second statement, the, when you say the soul is something, you are not committed to the fact that the soul is a, a substantial entity, right? When you say something cannot become nothing, you do not mean validly that a faculty or capacity can't go out of existence. It certainly can. For instance, if you have the faculty of vision, it's something. But if you become blinded, that faculty has vanished. It disappeared. That doesn't violate the law that something can't become nothing. Because something can't become nothing means an entity, a substance. Something made of ingredients, a stuff, can't suddenly vanish into nothing. But a particular configuration of some things, which give rise to a capacity, can certainly change their configuration, resulting in the capacity vanishing. And in that sense, certainly something can become nothing, in that sense of something. Now, if the soul is, in fact, as according to objectivism, it, it is a faculty of a living organism, then under certain conditions, that faculty no longer exists. Uh, so it's in a play on uh, something. Did anybody see something else wrong with this? Even let's suppose the soul were a substantial entity, like an apple. And therefore, it couldn't become nothing in the same way that an apple can't become nothing. Is there something wrong with the inference from it can't become nothing to therefore it will always exist? Well, do you want to finish since you started this? So what would you call this? I guess a relevant conclusion, an unwarranted non sequitur, even from it can't become nothing. Because look, an apple can't become nothing. <coughs> Can I conclude from that, therefore the apple will always exist? Obviously not. Those are not the only possibilities. Because the apple can disintegrate into its constituents. So that it's not the case that something has become literally nothing. But on the other hand, the apple as an apple has gone. And therefore, it is an irrelevant conclusion, a non sequitur. Or you might argue a false alternative, as though the only choice is the thing remains intact or becomes zero, when in fact it could disintegrate into its components. So this one, <coughs> which I was kind of pleased with, I thought it had a glow of plausibility to it, actually is hopeless. <laughs> Number 21, after the Admiral read his young son a story, he was tucked into his crib with his favorite teddy bear. Now that we don't need to spend any time on. Yes, amphiboly. Right. Who was tucked in? The young son or the admiral? Presumably they meant the young son. 22. This is a subject for a research project to be endowed by the Ford Foundation. <laughs> Do the creatures who live in UFOs employ ESP? Uh, yes. <laughs> You say it's a complex question because he's assuming that there are creatures who live in UFOs and he's assuming that there's ESP, both of which uh, are non-established. I certainly agree with that. Uh, in fact, I consider it whether there are UFOs as such, unless you simply mean by an identified flying object, literally that, some shape up in the air that you haven't identified. But as soon as they become equated with spaceships from Mars, then I put that in the same category as the proliferation of astrology, etc. So uh, this thing is positively riddled with, com with false or unwarranted assumptions. Number 23. This man heaves a brick through a window and thereby creates business for a glassmaker. Who uses the money that he gets to buy a suit and create business for a tailor, and etc., etc.? 
and therefore think of all the jobs and economic demand this has generated, we can only conclude that the man who broke the window actually helped the economy. And what fallacy is that? Yes, sir. You say false alternative. How do you get that? Oh, <laughs> you say he doesn't have to spend his money for, for the window, but I don't think that is essential to interpreting this fallacy because it says uh, um, the gl glassmaker will be able to buy, for instance, a suit. So we're simply uh, we're simply taking it as a pattern. It's not not a, it's true, of course. The baker might just decide to leave the window broken, and that would be the end of it. But in the normal case, he would decide to repair it, so let's grant him that. And then the repairer would be able to do something with the money, so let's grant him that. And the money would keep on passing from hand to hand. And in that sense, it would keep on, he argues, generating economic demand and employment. But it was, so it sounds like the guy is a real benefactor. And in fact, if you really want to uh, be a benefactor, you should wipe out the whole shop. Because then think of the demand. In fact, wipe out the whole city because that'd be massive demand. Drop an H-bomb on the entire country and think of the jobs that you'd open up. Now, what is... <laughs> that's all the same idea. Now, what is wrong with that? Yes? I think that's composition. You think it's composition, except if it was composition, it would have to be that each individual is benefiting in the whole country, therefore the country as a whole. But he doesn't say that everyone is. He says each... One benefits another and another, and maybe it stops after just six or eight. But in any event, he says, I've still provided all this business. Well, even if he weren't trying to conclude, though, that everyone is aided, suppose all he were trying to conclude is many people are aided. Yes. I think neglected aspect. Why? <laughs> you say, because the baker is out the original money that he has to use to buy a window that he can't now spend on something else. So at the most, what this hoodlum has done is divert demand from one area to another. He has not increased it. All the money that the baker spends on the window, he can't spend on something else. But of course, the other major aspect that's left out is if you consider the wealth of the economy as a whole. With each act of destruction, there is that much, left, much less wealth left, as the H-bomb example makes clear. If you wipe out the whole country, you're not going to argue we've helped the economy because look at the demand. There is now complete collapse. Uh, number 27. This is a real example from the Times. It's from a news column. This is Mr. Sandman. His supporters are counting on logic, and they have constructed the following. A majority oppose an income tax. Mr. Sandman says he'll save them from one, therefore a majority will vote for him. Now, this shows you where lack of logic will get you because he was defeated catastrophically. <laughs> now, uh, what went wrong with this argument? How do you identify it? Here, I think there are certain options. Yes? You say neglected aspect. What did he leave out? You say, well, first of all, there are other issues on which you would vote. And how do you decide that? How does he know that the uh, position on an income tax is the central issue which is going to determine their vote. And so he certainly neglected that fact. Is there any other fact that was neglected here? Even assume that the people in New Jersey during this election were prepared to vote exclusively on the base of the income tax. What other issue might come up? Yes. Well, to put that, what I think you're saying a little... Uh, more briefly, it may be the case that the people don't believe that Mr. Sandman will do anything about the income tax regardless of what he says. And therefore, even if that's the central issue in their lives, it won't uh, necessarily affect their vote. Now, if you constructed an argument like this, a majority of the voters oppose an income tax, and this is the decisive issue which will determine their vote. And Mr. Sandman says he'll save them from one, and they believe him. Then you'd be off the ground. But this way, now, in this case, because the aspects left out are so blatant that you may uh, simply have read it and say it's a non sequitur, it simply doesn't follow, I would accept a relevant conclusion. And here, 
the question is, does it strike you as plausible until you bring in other facts, in which case you'd call it neglected aspect, or is it just simply on the face of it a grotesque non sequitur? I prefer neglected aspect. I think that's a little more specific than a relevant conclusion. Let us look at 28. Genghis Khan must have been evil at birth because a man is either is born either fundamentally good or evil, and he's clearly not in the former category. Now, to begin with, how many people said this is an example of patidio? Because it is not. It is not a patidio. It is not begging the question. This, as an argument, is a perfect example of what type of argument that we took this evening. Well, I didn't say false, but it's a, uh, you're giving me the fallacy. But as a type of argument, it is an alternative argument, right? There's no begging the question. One premise tells you he's either good or evil, as obviously strong alternation. And then it says he's clearly not good, and therefore he must be evil. That's a perfect little alternative argument. Strong alternative premise, and it's perfectly valid in the sense that the conclusion follows from the premise, and the only thing wrong with it is, as you suggested, the premise is a false alternative. What is a third possibility beside being born fundamentally good or fundamentally evil? Your pardon? Born now. Supposing you're born neither. Supposing you're born simply tabula rasa. You're born blank. You're born without any moral character or tendency at all. And then you become good or evil depending upon the decisions you make and the conclusions you come to in the course of living. Well, in that case, there's a third alternative. So, the thing is clearly false alternative. Number 30, communism and capitalism are both radical, and the way out is the mixed economy. At the very back, yes. Middle of the road. You say middle of the road, but what's that called? Your pardon? Mm -hmm. Misuse of the mean, right. The fact that the mixed economy is in the middle does not mean that therefore you combine the advantages of each. It just as well means that you combine the worst feature of one and use it to destroy the good feature of the other, which you can see happening all around you uh, today. 31. Everybody wants the same thing, strength. Napoleon wanted a strong army, Adam Smith a strong economy, Aristotle strong arguments, my senator strong liquor. So they all want strength. What is this one? Yes. Equivocation. Equivocation. On the word strength. On the word strong or strength. And in, in what, uh, how many different senses is the word used in this argument? Several. Yeah. <laughs> Several is a safe, non-committal answer. <laughs> well, tell me the ones that you see. What does strong mean in connection with an army? Now, again, you don't have to give me a technical definition, but approximately. Strong army is powerful. Physically powerful, numerous, lots of weapons, etc. What does a strong economy mean? A healthy economy. Healthy, productive, abundant. What does strong argument mean? Convincing. Doesn't mean there's a lot of soldiers behind it, right? No. Logical, convincing. What does strong liquor mean? <laughs> you say seagrams. Oh, no, it's... <laughs> Undiluted. <laughs> so this is a fourfold equivocation. 32. You don't believe in government regulation of the economy, then you must be an anarchist. Yes. False alternative, you say. I agree. Why? Well, all you have to do is tell me what would a third alternative be. In other words, one can believe that there shouldn't be government regulation or anarchism, but that you can uh, have a government which protects individual rights, which has certain specific functions, but does not, one of its functions does not consist of regulating the economy. Consequently, this is a gross non sequitur, but I would not simply say that it's a relevant conclusion, because you can explain what's, what mediates the irrelevant conclusion in this case, namely offering a false alternative. 36. Development of literature is a great milestone. Mein Kampf was one of the most widely read books in world literature, and therefore it must have been a milestone in uh, civilization. What is that one? Yes. 
division. What's true of literature as a phenomenon, collectively, does not necessarily mean it's true of each individual work as an individual. Therefore, that's obviously division. 38. More people now become ill from smallpox vaccination than from smallpox itself. Therefore, let's get rid of vaccination. What is this? Yes. Neglected aspect. What is being neglected? The, yes, what's, what's being neglected is the fact that the reason that so few people get sm uh, ill from smallpox is because of the vaccination. And consequently, they simply take the fact, ignoring its cause. 39. The man says not uh, you, it's impossible to be perfect. On the other hand, people shouldn't be depraved. Let's be moderate morally. You know, we're all great. Nobody is morally black or white. At the very back, yes. Certainly misuse of the mean, the assumption that a moderate position is desirable because it's moderate. Could you call it anything else? What about the part that says nobody is black or white? Yes. You say it's stolen concept, and you're referring to Ms. Rand's point that to form the concept of gray morally, you have to have black uh, and white. That's certainly true, but I was thinking of a simpler one. That is a cliché. Nobody is black or white, a completely unjustified uh, cliché. Uh, and if you know anything about world history, there's a considerable number of morally black uh, people. And presumably, if you are uh, intellectually honest, that in objectivist terms is all that's required for you to be morally white. It doesn't mean uh, moral perfection that you have to be omniscient or infallible. So in that sense, this whole cliche is simply wrong. 41. It's how evil slavery is in Russia. Therefore, he's going to quit going to college where he's a slave to lectures, study, exams, and so on. What uh, is the fallacy here on the aisle? Yes. Equivocation on slave or slavery, and what are the two usages? In one case, slavery, let's say for short, is physical coercion where the state owns and controls your whole life. And in the other case, in college, slavery simply means he's performing a routine he doesn't like, but nobody is forcing him to do it, so it's equivocation. Now, let me do a few here to see if we can get finished. 42 is obviously two amphibolous headlines. Mayor attacks obscenity at Junior League T. Well, did he do the attacking at the T? Or was the obscenity at the tea? And Master Chef likes dessert more than wife? Does he like dessert more than his wife likes dessert? Or does he like dessert more than he likes his wife? 47. Each uh, particle that makes up the human body is rigorously determined. Therefore, the man as a whole is rigorously determined and free will is a myth. Now, what, uh, this is a good philosophic example of one fallacy. What fallacy? We only have a minute or two, yes. Composition, right. Why doesn't it follow? Suppose it's true that every subparticle, as a subparticle, follows inexorable laws. Why does it not follow that the man, as a man, is determined? Because the whole does not have to have the characteristic of, a, of its constituents. And according, of course, to objectivism, when you put all the constituents together into a human being, well, one of the attributes of the whole is volition. And consequently, uh, this is composition. Now, of course, you have to give a proof of free will, but I'm simply saying this argument, as stated, is invalid. 48. People are always going to disagree, therefore wars will always go on, can never be eradicated. All I had in mind in this limp example is a crude non sequitur. An irrelevant conclusion, it simply doesn't follow. Why couldn't people dispute and disagree and do so peacefully without resorting 
to the instruments of war. So it's, I just, I have nothing fancy in mind but a relevant conclusion. Uh, number 50, machines cause unemployment. Every time a machine does a job that a man could be doing, the man is thrown out of work. All I had in mind for this is neglected aspect. What's left out of account, all the person sees is that the man loses his job, but what's left out of account is the machine makes the production much cheaper. People have to spend less money on its output, therefore they're free to have more money to divert to other uses, and demand is simply changed, and the man changes his job, and by this means the country as a whole becomes wealthier and wealthier, and can sustain an incredibly larger population, all at full employment. 51. You can ignore his arguments against religion. As soon as he confronts his own weakness, he'll forget them himself. Well, that simply is saying he himself will personally be inconsistent with his argument, and therefore you can't ignore his argument, and that is circumstantial ad hominem, accusing him of being, or of being about to be personally inconsistent. Then you can toss in, if you want, the statement there are no atheists in foxholes. as cliche thinking on top of it. You can toss that in. 52. Watergate proves that the president can't have unlimited power, therefore let's give that power to Congress, which is what the uh, liberal editorials are currently saying, and this is clearly a false alternative. What about a government of limited power? Instead of the choice being unlimited power by the government, by the Congress or the president. 53. How do you explain the telekinetic abilities demonstrated at Duke University? I don't, because I challenge the assumption of the question, namely that such abilities are demonstrated, and that I call a complex question, question on an unwarranted assumption. I think we have time to do just one more, so that'll give us four, I think, left over for next week. If a person is in love, he wants to communicate with the person he loves. He hasn't telephoned me for two days, therefore he doesn't love me. That is a relevant conclusion. Does not follow. It simply tells you if he's in love, he wants to communicate. It doesn't follow that he's going to phone at a specified interval, uh, and therefore this is a completely unwarranted leap, irrelevant conclusion. Well, that gives us 55, 6, 9, and 61, and we'll pick those four up next week along with the... Uh, homework on hypothetical and alternative arguments. Okay, we'll draw a line here. Thank you.